Okay, um, I'll make a start. So I'm Emma Foster, and I have the pleasure of chairing what I think is the first panel for today uh, on COP26 and the climate emergency. Um, we're lucky to have four fantastic speakers, um, each of which are going to present for around 10 minutes. What I'll do is I'll, um, I'll turn my camera off when you're when you're speaking and turn it back on when it comes up to around 10 minutes as a signal that you're coming to the end but we're not terribly strict but we're a little bit strict about the timings okay so um when you see me it's coming to the end of of, of, of your your time as a speaker to speak um there'll be these four four presentations that'll be followed by a question and answer session once we've heard all of the presentations um the event is being recorded um but the question and answer session, even though it's recorded, won't be shared more widely. So if you do um, want to ask a question, feel free to speak freely um, when we get to that point of the proceedings. Um, can I ask presenters to keep their cameras on uh, during, their, during the session and attendees to keep their microphones off until it comes to the point where they might ask a question. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to run this in the way that the schedule is presented. So we're going to start off with um, Dr. Joanna Flavel, um, and she's going to kick us off. Uh, Joanna is based at the University of Manchester, and her research focuses on, among other things, gender and climate change. So if I pass on to Joanna now, and I'll mute myself. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, I'm Joanna Flavel or Flavel or however it comes out. Um, I actually just moved from the University of Manchester to take up a fellowship at LSE. Um, so bear with me, I'm in the middle of a horrible moving um, experience and settling into a new job and a new home and, and a snoring dog on the side of me. So bear with me. Um, I finished my PhD at the end of last year um, on the women and gender constituency in the UNFCCC. So I was looking at the, the, the political strategies of feminists trying to mainstream gender into the UNFCCC. Um, so that's kind of what I wanna, wanna speak about today. Um, so in my, I don't know if, if you know much about the women and gender constituency, but in short there it's, one of the kind of lobby groups in the UN climate change. Um, there's 28 women's and feminist NGOs as part of the constituency, and they've been really active throughout the history of the COPs um, in different sort of formulations through kind of an informal network um, to what is now quite a powerful constituency. Um, and they have been really instrumental in negotiating um, the, the adoption of the Gender Action Plan, which has been renew, renewed now for five years. Um, and a lot of their focus has been about kind of getting the word on the page um, and also making the case that gender matters in global climate change politics. Um, so my, the argument of my thesis was, was essentially that the women and gender constituency have been really, really remarkable in what they've managed to achieve in quite a short, short history in, in UN terms. Um, like I say, they've got the gender action plan, the, the, the word gender and women, particularly women's vulnerability, appears in the Paris Agreement. Um, and I, I think it's probably a fair claim to say that gender has been largely mainstreamed in the UNFCCC because of their efforts. And what I found was that through doing that, there were four main rhetorical strategies that they relied upon um, throughout the history. So the first of those um, was making arguments based on gender equality and the empowerment of women. So this was really about focusing on women's inclusion, both in the negotiations. So a lot of their work has been about ensuring more gender balanced um, uh, negotiating teams um, in parties and also on various UNFCCC boards, but also as local resource manager. So the sort of implementation of climate change politics and ensuring that women are better represented at local levels, particularly in the global South. And the second rhetorical strategy, um, which is probably the most common one, was kind of about universalizing lived experience of women, kind of looking for an easy way to hook the issue of, of particularly women um, into climate change politics. So this was really about foregrounding women's poverty um, as a means for political action and focusing on women's vulnerability. So there was the kind of widely used claim that women and children are 
I think it's 13 times more likely to die in a natural disaster event than men. And this was kind of what was used in the early days to say that we have to pay attention to gender, i.e. meaning women, um, because women are more vulnerable in a, in a changing climate. Um, and I think that this kind of rhetorical strategy has been sort of widely criticized by feminist academics or feminist environmental academics for good reasons, which, which I do agree with. But I, I do think that perhaps it has been a necessary step for the women and gender constituency. Um, the third rhetorical strategy is about equating gender with women. So it kind of relates to the previous one. So again, it's about the, the typically foregrounded women's issues while backgrounding issues of gender. And there are a few moments in the history of sort of feminist activity in the UNFCCC where people have tried to sort of insert the, insert the term masculinities. And it's always been met with, with somewhat hostility, both by negotiators, but also members of the women and gender constituency themselves, sort of saying, you know, we don't want to fight a war against men, but not really recognizing broader implications of um, of what masculinity means in this sorts of terms. So they've kind of typically so far avoided um, talking about femininities and masculinities in favor of focusing on, on women, um, and particularly brown vulnerable women of the global south. Um, but more recently, I would say probably since Paris, um, there's been a, the introduction of maybe a fourth rhetorical strategy, which, which I've always termed intersectionality in baby steps. So they're starting to kind of make arguments based on multiple axes of social inequalities, um, moving beyond just focusing on women to, to focusing more on, on intersectionality. So um, particularly in the inclusion of young women and indigenous women um, through various methods, mostly internally though, mostly internal to the women and gender constituency and not so much through um, trying to get sort of intersectionality into policy documents. Um, and all of this is kind of done through various more procedural um, tactics, but one of the main things that the women and gender constituency do is about focusing on getting the word on the page. So getting the word women into the Paris Agreement or getting the word women into whatever is kind of the hot topic of, of the COP. And again, it has been really um, successful, but per, pretty limited in terms of you know, women is included in the Paris Agreement, but it's only in the preamble. It doesn't mean very much. Um, and the argument that some in the women and gender constituency put forward as well, it's, no, this is important because it sets the precedent. It's a good thing. Whereas others are sort of saying, well, it only matters if, if women are included in the ways we want it to be included. Um, so that's kind of like what my, my research has previously been focused on. I'm working on um, turning that into a book manuscript, but Moving into COP26, I've kind of noticed in the past few months a pretty interesting trend um, on intersectionality where there's a distinct shift in the use of intersectionality as a concept and as a word um, leading up to negotiations. So for example, Bridget Burns, who's um, one of the co-focal points for the constituency, um, has recently been um, advertising for a job and she's written on, on Twitter, come and join us in critical intersectional feminist work to demand global climate justice. Um, and all of the women and gender constituencies demands in the lead up to COP26 are partly because there's not like a, a gender, agen gender agenda item to focus on. They're far more broad and far more, I would say feminist rather than thinking about women. So their demands kind of connect COVID-19 to global injustice or intersectional injustices. Um, and climate change kind of connecting those issues rather than siloing, um, which we spoke about in the, the previous uh, keynote. And their demands are kind of for a far more broad, a broad feminist approach and not just focusing on women. So for example, they're talking about issues like loss and damage um, and sort of advocating for climate migration in line with gender responsive finance and so on. Um, they're also lobbying a, a quite a strong critique of, of the concept of net zero at the moment. Um, sort of the claim being that the concept of net zero has, has been broadly greenwashed um, and is contributing to carbon colonialism. colonialism. So the, essentially there is this shift towards A, using the word intersectionality far more liberally, 
um, but B, trying to connect broader issues and not trying to silo themselves and their issues to women's issues, but trying to take on this kind of feminist approach, um, which is great news, but also frustrating for my book manuscript, because that was my argument of what they needed to do in, in future. So I don't know what I'm going to do with that. Um, so obviously I've not kind of looked into this, but I think this is where I want my research to go in the future. So some of the key questions that I'm thinking about looking forward to COP26 is, you know, why has this shift taken place and what does it mean? You know, is it because the shift is less towards getting the issue, the word on the page and more to how do we implement this policy and therefore it becomes more important? Um, and kind of what is like the meaning of the word intersectionality? How is that? How does that matter to the women and gender constituency and, and what is that going to mean for the rest of, of the COP negotiations? Um, and I also wonder how it will start to affect key relationships, so both with negotiators who have typically kind of avoided anything more than we just include vulnerable women um, and the secretariat, who they have a really good working relationship. But I wonder how it will affect the, the relationship between different um, constituencies if you're going to take on a more intersectional approach to, to lobbying, it's, it's probably not appropriate to, to lobby as a women and gender constituency while ignoring ENGOs or youth or indigenous peoples. Um, and I think there's lots of optimism going into to COP26 from the women and gender constituency. Um, and I, I wonder how that's gonna, gonna pan out because they ended up being quite disappointed after COP21, for example. Um, so yeah, this is kind of the future direction that I want my, my research um, to think about. And, just very quickly sort of drawing on the twin cop thing I wonder you know the, the constituency doesn't just work in in the UNFCCC but they also lobby in in other cops like biodiversity um so I wonder this turn toward a more intersectional approach what will that mean for connecting different issues yeah that's me thank you Thank you, Joanna. That was a really interesting paper. We'll move on and then we'll take questions at the end, um, as, I, as I introduced at the beginning there. And um, so next up, we've got Anna Aberg and um, Anna is from Chatham House and is a policy analyst and looks at sustainability and um, governance. So if I pass on to Anna now. Thanks very much, Emma. And uh, thanks also, Johanna. That was super interesting. I learned a lot. Uh, and good morning to everyone. It's a real pleasure to be on this panel. Uh, as Emma said, I, uh, I work at Chatham House. Uh, I'm a research analyst and I've been there for around two years now. Uh, my work mainly focuses on international climate politics, UN climate negotiations, uh, climate finance and energy transition. So I guess quite a broad, uh, but very interesting portfolio, I think at least. Uh, before I started working at Chatham House, I worked at the Swedish uh, Ministry for Foreign Affairs, uh, where I was a desk officer for the World Bank, and then I worked on global ocean issues and on humanitarian affairs uh, for a while as well. So um, in my uh, initial presentation, I will kind of elaborate a bit more on COP26. Um, what can be expected? What might a positive outcome look like? And kind of where do we stand. So um, as I'm uh, sure you're aware, uh, COP26 is taking place this autumn, uh, 31st October to 12th November in Glasgow. It's uh, hosted by the UK in partnership with Italy. Uh, it has been postponed by a year uh, due to the pandemic. And there are also kind of increasing calls to delay it further. Uh, the Climate Action Network, for instance, released a press statement on Tuesday calling for further postponement um, because uh, there are genuine concerns about inclusivity and participation, not least from developing countries. Um, as you all know, um, the kind of the distribution of vaccines and um, uh, yeah, the rate of vaccinations varies very widely across the world. Uh, we're doing quite well now in Western countries, but in many developing countries, uh, a very small proportion of the population has received jabs. Uh, the UK has announced that it is gonna help, that it is helping uh, delegations who do not have access to vaccines to get these. But I mean, that announcement came very late. Uh, I think it was obvious that the UK would need to do this, but they waited until you know, the summer to announce this. And the first 
jabs were only delivered this week. So uh, it would be very tight to ensure that a large proportion of those who need these vaccines are able to get double jabbed before the conference if they are to attend in person, which is uh, important. Um, another kind of issue that inhibits participation is that uh, delegates from the so-called uh, red list, um, uh, they will need to quarantine even if they're double jabbed for uh, five days, um, which also presents another kind of obstacle to participation. And then there are, of course, also restrictions in other countries in the UK which impact this. So the UK, is, the UK government is saying that it will go uh, ahead, and I will kind of assume in my remarks now that it is going ahead, but this is a really crucial issue uh, that will require further work ahead of the, the summit. Anyway, so COP26 um, is, as the name can tell, kind of the 26th edition of the UN's annual climate change conference. Uh, and it's considered to be one of the most important climate change conferences ever. Um, so why is this the case? Why is it so important? Well, by signing the Paris Agreement, uh, which governments did uh, back in Paris in 2015, uh, they agreed to limit the rise in the global average temperature to well below two degrees, preferably 1.5 degrees. Um, and this might not sound like much, but half a degree makes a huge difference. Um, and as uh, the most recent IPCC report underscored, it is still possible to limit the rise to this critical threshold of 1.5 degrees, but only if we take really substantial action now. Uh, to kind of be on track for 1.5 degrees, we need to halt global emissions this decade before uh, reaching net zero around mid-century. So Glasgow really comes at this crucial at the start of this crucial decade for climate action. Um, as I'm sure most of you know as well, uh, the Paris Agreement has this bottom-up approach where governments themselves decide by how much they want to reduce emissions or aim to reduce emissions by a certain year. Uh, and these plans are called nationally determined contributions. Uh, the first round of NDCs were submitted around the uh, adoption of the Paris Agreement. Uh, but when put together, these were not ambitious enough to put us on track for the Paris goals. And Glasgow is kind of the first, uh, well, and then, but there, the Paris Agreement is designed to kind of increase ambition over time. So every five years, governments are supposed to submit new plans. And the expectation is that ambition will increase over time. So COP26 is the first test of this uh, mechanism. And that is really kind of a key task of this summit. Um, at the end of July, around uh, 100, well, 110 countries, uh, around 58% of uh, the UNFCCC or the Paris signatories, uh, had submitted updated uh, NDCs. And some of these have been in the upper limits of what uh, many experts and analysts thought. Uh, the US, for instance, has committed to reducing emissions uh, 50 to 52% by 2030. Uh, the EU has a new target of at least 55% by 2030. Uh, and the UK uh, is aiming for 68% by 2030 and 78% by 2035. But we're still, we're still a very long way. Uh, we're still very far away from where we need to be in terms of alignment with the 1.5 degree target of the Paris Agreement and two degrees too. This is both because uh, many of the pledges that have been submitted to date have not been ambitious enough. Some countries haven't increased ambition at all, uh, including Indonesia and Mexico. And it is also because some big economies especially have yet to submit uh, plans, including China, South Africa, and India. So a really great outcome uh, at COP26 would be that all countries submit updated uh, NDCs, uh, and that when put together, these are ambitious enough to put us on track for 1.5 degrees. Uh, the G20 governments are, of course, really important. Uh, during a meeting this summer, they said that they would um, all, I'm struggling now to find the exact phrase, intend to update or communicate ambitious indices by COP26. And time is really running out. So with just a few weeks uh, left, it's time to step up. Regardless, I think it's safe to say that closing this gap to 1.5 will be a major uh, challenge. Uh, it's quite likely that we reach COP26 uh, without having closed this gap. And if that is the case, it would be important that governments formulate some kind of vision or strategy for how to ramp up ambition in the early 2020s, uh, just because we're really running out of time and this challenge is so urgent. <laughs> 
Uh, what could this include? Uh, they could, for instance, it could, for instance, be a case of uh, a COP decision inviting governments to revisit NDCs earlier with the intention of ramping up ambition uh, again by 2023, for instance, instead of 2025. Uh, this can also be done through political statements if a COP decision is not possible. And there are also other kind of actions that can be taken to make sure that we kind of keep 1.5 degrees within reach. Uh, there are, for instance, discussions going on around uh, phasing out coal production that would be really important um, if a plurilateral deal can be struck on that issue, for instance. Uh, there are also discussions going on around protecting nature and rolling out electric vehicles, uh, for instance. Uh, and in addition to that, I think it will be important, it will, you know, the integrity of these pledges uh, is of course very important. Uh, it's not enough to just pledge. Uh, there needs to be some kind of genuine commitment to implement this. So to the extent possible, I think it would be uh, send a very good sign at COP26 and be a mark of credibility. Uh, if as many governments as possible were able to kind of back up their pledges with concrete policies at the national level too. So yes, NDCs and mitigation is an important area for COP26, but it's really not just about that. Uh, it's also absolutely essential that COP26 uh, and what governments do ahead of COP26 addresses issues such as climate finance, adaptation, and loss and damage. Um, on climate finance, uh, the main issue there is that uh, developed countries made a pledge in 2009, so you know, absolutely ages ago, uh, of mobilizing 100 billion US dollars per year in climate finance for developing countries. And of course, you know, this is a, a drop in the ocean uh, compared to what is needed to finance uh, climate mitigation, adaptation, and addressing loss and damage in developing countries. But this pledge is very much an issue of trust. Uh, it was an essential part of the bargain underlying the Paris Agreement, and uh, not delivering on this pledge would, again, yes, undermine trust and would uh, kind of cast a wet blanket over other areas of the negotiations as well. Uh, the most recent kind of up-to-date official statistics are from 2018. They showed that uh, there was a gap of around 20 um, billion at that point in time. Uh, most of Serbia's uh, now and government officials are saying that the pledge has not been met and it is very, you know, uh, I'm providing clarity on this issue ahead of COP26, showing that the goal would be met this year and providing clarity on the way forward. It's an absolutely essential prerequisite for success at COP26. Uh, Germany and Canada have been tasked with uh, developing a delivery plan for the 100 billion, uh, which will ideally show then how the funds will be mobilized uh, up to 2025, because it's not just about delivering this on one year, it needs to be delivered every single year up to 2025. It will be very important that this plan is as concrete and detailed as possible to kind of provide instill confidence and inject political, uh, positive political dynamism in the COP process. It also needs to be published ahead of COP26. Uh, it will also be crucial that finance for adaptation is scaled up, and this is something that should be addressed in this plan. I can see that Emma is popping up, so I will try to close off and then I can address any final uh, remarks in the question time. Um, in addition to scaling up finance for adaptation, it would be important to that governments make progress on further operationalizing something called the global goal on adaptation and that there is sufficient political space provided at COP26 for discussions around loss and damage, which is uh, climate impacts that cannot be avoided through mitigation and adaptation. This has historically been a very contentious issue, but it is a real problem. A solution needs to be found. And I think moving away from a narrative that emphasizes kind of the historic liability of developing countries and going towards a more of a solidarity framing on this issue could work. So I will stop there and happy to pick up on any other questions in the Q&A session. Thanks very much. Thank you, Anna. That was a really um, fascinating overview, actually. Um, thank you very much for that. So we're going to move on um, now to uh, Richard Beersworth from the University of Leeds, um, where he's head of school for politics and international studies. Richard's interests are in international politics and state responsibility in relation to climate change, among other global challenges. So um, Richard, if you want to take the floor, 
Thank you very much, Emma. And I apologize, I gather my signature is my daughter, Rosetta, who sabotaged my Zoom account last night, and I only realized before coming on. Anyway, uh, my name is Richard Bitter, yes, and I'm also uh, co-chairing co the COP26 task force uh, for the University of Leeds, which is an observer at uh, COP26 Glasgow. Um, Thank you, Emma, and many thanks for the invitation in general to the Environmental uh, Committee at PSA uh, to this panel, which is really interesting, very interesting people, and it's a very interesting day as well, so I'm very glad to be here. Um, Anna has basically said everything that I was going to say, um, so um, thanks to Anna. I will repeat a bit, um, but I will. there are several nuances I want to give, but um, I think my take is quite similar to Anna's and she was extremely comprehensive in what she said. Uh, I'll never, I'll make my points, but I'll keep it to 10 minutes and Emma obviously will stop me at the end of that. Um, I have sort of nine points. My first point is that I do believe that this COP, COP26 takes place, takes place in an unprecedented moment. I think more unprecedented clearly than the Paris Agreement of COP21. Uh, there's both the COVID, which Anna has referred to post-COVID is clearly not the term to be using at the moment, but COVID transition with regard to the recovery. Uh, there is now quite clearly climate change is now a reality, not only for developing countries or more vulnerable countries, but also for resilient countries and developed countries, as we see each summer particularly. And we've just had the IPCC, uh, IPCC six assessment report, which says very clearly um, the climate change, the impacts of climate change are widespread uh, and severe. Um, and as uh, the atmospheric scientist Michael Lee Mann has uh, clearly underlined with regard to that, uh, this is the first time that the IPCC, which is a fairly conservative group with regard to reporting uh, overall climate science, because it has to get minimal consensus, this is the first time that uh, such a bold statement has been made. Uh, they also say, as Anna alluded to, uh, I think as well, is the window of opportunity to limit effects to two degrees or even 1.5 are still there. The opportunities are still there, but they are closing rapidly. Hence, the question of urgency and climate emergency, uh, which I think we've uh, all of us have referred to so far. Um, in this context, then, COP26 is simply vital regarding climate action. That is to say, the response to climate knowledge. Um, this is the first review in the cycle uh, with regard to the Paris Agreement, which sets the framework, uh, as Anna uh, purposely said. Uh, it is a five-year review, and it is with regard to basically uh, countries uh, that bottom-up uh, approach, uh, rather than a sort of post-Kyoto uh, legal treaty, which never came about, uh, nationally determined contributions, and critically, the question of the relationship between pledges and implementation pathways, which we are clearly all focused upon here. In that context, then, uh, what are the goals of COP26? Um, firstly, they are phasing out coal, the tailing of deforestation, uh, which sounds uh, rather glib at this moment in time, um, switching to electric cars and then ultimately vans and trucks and financial investment in renewables. And those are placed predominantly within the question of mitigation. And then with regard to adaptation and new, hopefully new uh, national adaptation plans, um, which will uh, be forthcoming, one hopes out of the legacy of COP26 to refer back to what Anna's saying about what's going to come out of it if things aren't achieved at COP26 as we would wish. Um, then uh, with regard to adaptation, the help to more vulnerable countries to adapt to climate realities. And there the question, the key term is obviously resilience, uh, resilience of infrastructure, resilience of agriculture and water systems, particularly with regard to drought and flooding, and the protection of ecosystems, so the dovetailing of the legacy of COP26 with the Sustainable Development Goals and the whole question of sustainable farming. And that's where 2030 and 2030 join together very strongly with regard to what uh, was alluded to earlier by Anna as solidarity among nations. 
Um, the third goal is mobilizing finance, uh, both to mitigate loss, question of loss and damage, but also to set up structures uh, of help with regard to environmental, economic and social transitions under general climate transition. And they're uh, quite an interesting, uh, I think, organization to look at, which is being, I think, spearheaded by Mark Carney, is the Glasgow Financial Alliance for net zero. And then finally, collaboration. So a lot of this is state-led very clearly, and I think very interesting, and I'll come back to that. But then fourthly, the goal of collaboration among governments, businesses, uh, and civil society. So uh, in a sense, uh, some attempt to get beyond the blue zone, green zone, green zone uh, distinctions at point. Now, I think that despite the realities of the moment, this dynamic is very important. There has clearly been a normative shift in the last two years, promoted by global civil society action, particularly the youth strikes, by COVID, and by increasing climate events for the less vulnerable. Um, there's been a normative shift uh, towards climate action and towards political willing. Uh, as we take stock of where we are in the climate emergency, and that question of the we is obviously highly problematic, I do not think we should underestimate this shift. Um, the climate deniers are, for example, having to radically rethink their tactics from 1980 to, to 2010. And as I said, the assessment report, six assessment report from the IPCC is absolutely clear, that despite the fact that its organization is one of minimal consensus. And I think within this normative shift, what we're seeing more widely here, uh, societally, is a really important role for, for the state and for government. And that, will, uh, that is crucial with regard to thinking the climate transition as one of systemic change, the state as interventionist, the state as the upholder of public goods, the state as the place with its monopoly of violence, to put it in Weberian terms, to be able to enact comprehensive policies and to be able to implement crucial with regard to uh, the question of climate action. And the fact that the governments uh, can be cross-sector and cross-ministry. Obviously, there will be huge uh, budget wars that come up in the next decade, but the role of government now is absolutely critical towards effective climate action. And that means there's going to be, uh, there's already undergoing, obviously, but a complete, I think, rethinking of the role of government within society. I think with regard to both mitigation and adaptation, obviously, we're looking to the transformation of the global economy and of the human energy system as a whole, uh, in particularly the question of the exploration of fossil fuels. And that should never, that overall large transformational uh, concern, which was obviously foregrounded very strongly uh, by uh, the, the youth strikes, that overall concern mustn't be lost within policy implementation. Of, often policy implementation becomes very professional, very siloed, very specific to sectors. I think what is critical to COP26, and it's certainly being upheld for the moment, at least normatively, by the UK presidency, is this sense, not that it's necessarily following through in terms of policies, far from it, um, but this sense that we are in a moment of huge social transition with regard to what is needed to get to a uh, net zero society by 2050. There are obviously a lot of unknowns there, particularly with regard to uh, the Asian countries. So tacking back what will be, to ask that question again, successful COP26, I think it'll be very important to see whether US global leadership, uh, which was very much promoted by Biden back in January and February, and indeed in March with regard to his own summit, um, and with that, um, that pledge of 50 to 52% based on 2005 to uh, 2030, um, whether US global leadership is really there or not, whether it can really have a place at COP26, I think a lot of us coming from international relations will be very, very interested in that moment because we all know that uh, with a, a democratic mandate, uh, regimes change very quickly. And in the US at the moment, it remains a very polarized society. So those changes can be huge. 
Um, it is important that more than more than half, at the moment it's 110, uh, as Anna referred to with regard to the end of July, update their pledges. And particularly we need to look at Australia, Brazil, Indonesia, uh, the Russian Federation and Mexico. And I think that with regard to setting targets, we must all be looking at, uh, I am only presuming, uh, China, India and Australia. I think also an important successful outcome would be to see not simply these being delivered, um, but that we see a financial delivery plan being affected by the G7 uh, for vulnerable countries, which was alluded to earlier, and which is clearly uh, still very absent. Uh, and I do think that on, a, on, a, on one point with regard to that initial goal around curtailing deforestation, to have a sense whether uh, we can be anywhere near stopping deforestation by 2030. Uh, there needs to be a very serious conversation with Brazil around that in Glasgow, and one needs to be extremely bold and clear about that. So that said, I'm coming to the end. Um, there are reasons for optimism. We are in a dynamic. COP26 is part of that dynamic. There are very clearly pledges that need to be met and implementation pathways that need to be followed through. But we know what we're looking at now uh, as social scientists. Um, but the reasons to be vigilant, critical, and to remain activist uh, in terms of putting pressure on governments are very clear. And I just want to allude to several stats. Yeah? which I find very interesting at this moment of our COVID transition, our possible post-COVID recovery. In 2019, the direct support for fossil fuels uh, uh, was among the G20 countries, $636 billion, with the US, Canada and Australia increasing their support. That is only a 10% decrease since 2015. From 2015 to 2019, $3.3 trillion of both direct and indirect support leases, for example, for oil, coal and gas um, have been spent, uh, with support for coal increasing in China, South Africa, Japan, and obviously momentarily with the swing. Well, it, it's not possible, but it can be uh, rhetorically organized uh, in the US. These are huge figures. Yes. 1.2 trillion in the post-COVID recovery set aside for carbon intensive sectors globally, like aviation and construction, uh, without any green dimension to them, compared to $363 billion being spent on green related activities. And globally, again, in my last uh, uh, financial comments, and I'll, I'll drop my conclusion, countries have spent 16.7 trillion, it is estimated, in stimulus funding, but only France and Japan are the two G20 countries that have allocated more or the same finance to green activities compared with carbon intensive sectors. So there is, an enormous uh, gap to be bridged. And it is quite clear that the post-COVID recovery um, is extremely ambivalent with regard to that, despite our hopes that it could be the opportunity to get to something like green growth. So in conclusion, COP26 now, the climate emergency, uh, there is reason for optimism. There is clearly a dynamic undergoing, a normative shift is taking place, and COP26 is very much part of that dynamic. Uh, and in terms of state-led action, it has a very important legacy, even if particular commitments are not made at 26 itself, which is where maybe we will end up talking about the Glasgow goals as a whole. And on the other hand, frustration and anger at the gaps between climate knowledge and climate action and between climate pledges and climate implementation. And it's obviously within those gaps that we must act as strongly as possible. Emma, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Richard. It's really uh, insightful hearing about, you know, the multi-level international relations surrounding COP26. So, so thanks a lot for those insights. Um, last but not least, we're going up to move on to um, John Vogler, 
John um, is from the University of Kiel and um, gonna, is going to present the last paper for today. His research focuses on uh, the international relations of the environment and he has written extensively on the global commons, oceans, the atmosphere and even outer space. So I'll move on to you, John. Um, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Am I coming through all right? Okay. Um, well, I want... I want to talk about the international politics of this COP as a professor of international relations. Um, and I suppose I start from the thought that uh, we've seen enormous changes since the beginning of all of this in the 1980s. And uh, obviously the, the uh, signature of the UNFCCC in uh, 1992. Uh, back when I started looking at this env environment and envir international environmental cooperation, it's very much seen as low politics, you know, it was uh, functional te uh, technical activity, which really could be isolated from mainstream international politics. And sometimes one comes across that even now. And uh, I, I happened to be rereading E.H. Carr the other day uh, about this, because he was writing, obviously, in 1939. He was discussing something similar. He was talking about the, when it issues when items become politicised. And um, he mentioned as an example of uh, a kind of apolitical, technical international undertaking, the control of epidemics and pandemics. So I think that kind of makes the point that it is um, quite easy to cross from the realm of, of low politics to high politics. Um, the COP, I would regard, I mean, I wouldn't oversell a COP26, um, it's part of a long-term process. Uh, it's a process um, which has not been very successful, if you look at it over the years, it's been going a very long time in terms of meeting its stated objectives. But it's also a process that's taken part within a context of enormous structural change within the international system. And um, one feels there must be some interrelationship between the two. Uh, the, to make this very specific at the moment, the extent to which this COP can be isolated from other political issues and in particular the deteriorating relationship between great powers, um, that's a moot point. Clearly when one looks at the United States, and uh, one I want to say here that I'm not sure that, you know, whereas in the past one could have seen the United States as, as a hegemonic power, a hegemonic stability thesis and all of that, um, it's pretty clear that in environmental politics, the United States has not played that role, certainly since the, um, the, 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 the Montreal Protocol, the ozone, the ozone Protocol. Um, it's pretty clear now, though, that uh, the US has returned, as we've seen. But the line that has been taken is, is by John Kerry, who represents the president on climate issues, is clearly at odds with what is being done by the rest of the US government and the State Department. We're really uh, ramping up um, uh, a narrative about a primary confrontation between the United States and China as China is the rising uh, competitor power uh, amid all manner of uh, accusations in relation to trade and of course of human rights. So what Kerry is trying to do is to effect a compartmentalization of the climate issue from all these other issues that are bedeviling US-China relations. Um, the key question is, is this possible? Because we remember that uh, it is quite significant if you can achieve some sort of deal between the Chinese and the Americans, because this appears to be one factor that facilitated the, that facilitated the agreement in Paris. You can, of course, challenge the whole thing and argue that maybe um, the international cooperation aspect of all this is, is secondary, and that what really matters is what the Chinese decide to do domestically. And uh, the impact of the international dimension is, is possibly marginal. Uh, that's a, an open and very interesting question. Um, question of whether they can arrive at uh, 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 before Glasgow or at some sort of conception of common fate interdependence between the US and, and China. Um, if I try to make the argument that climate is separable, um, the main 
alignments in on climate, when you look back over the history, often seem to cut across what one might describe as the normal patterns of international politics. I mean, look at the basic group, for example. Um, this is very different. I mean, basic um, is set up on the basis of a, a set of shared issues between countries that in, in, in other respects are at odds with each other. We think of the India-China relationship, for example. Um, you look also historically at the way the EU, the EU and the US uh, have had their differences between the US and the un umbrella group in, uh, over the history of the COP. Um, and you can argue generally that parties can be relied upon to pursue their particular economic and energy interests in relation to climate. Um, you can see this, for example, in the knotty problems of trying to get some uh, agreement on Article 6, which, of course, in terms of specific negotiations, is something that one looks to, um, uh, looks to as an outcome of the current COP because the rule book has not yet been completed. So it, it, there isn't a clear alignment, if you like, between the general patterns of international competition and what has gone on uh, in climate politics. And the other main axis of climate politics, of course, is the North-South one, which is, I think, um, inadequately covered in our discussions of climate politics. Uh, it, it's always worth remembering that for most of the states in the international system, uh, this is a North-South issue. It, it, what the, the stakes for them are development, climate justice, uh, loss and damage, adaptation, and the UNFCCC has been an arena of some significant importance for them over the years, but it's an arena which you might describe as democratic in the sense that uh, they have a voice uh, in climate politics in a way they don't have a voice in other international organisations and arena. So in that sense, you can say that uh, there isn't, um, you know, the, the climate politics apart from the, I think in the case of North-South relations, cuts, can cut across normal um, international politics. However, and I think this is the main point I'd like to make, the COPs have always had a highly political function, which in many ways is unrelated to their stated purpose. Um, and you can see this, especially in their reputational aspects. If you look at the Sort of endless uh, plenary meetings and think about what is actually being achieved here um, uh, during the, the, the COP, the high level segment, etc. Um, we're really talking about status seeking, we're talking about a whole range of, of other issues. And I feel this is in general underappreciated in much of the analysis that goes on, which sticks to, if you like, the formal issues. Um, that have been debated, rather than, as I say, these political functions that uh, or, or the, the COPs have played over the years. Now, we talked about the importance of the COP, COP26. I'm not sure about, you know, what the outcome will be and what the um, importance will be for specific changes in our energy systems and all the other things we need to do in in, in, to deal with the climate emergency. What I am sure about is that COP26 is of very, very serious and primary importance for Her Majesty's government. Um, the potential payoffs and pitfalls are seen as very, very significant. So um, it is this reputational side of things, I think, <laughs> as I say, which, which comes into focus when you think of it from a UK perspective in relation to aspirations to global Britain and all of that. Uh, the other interesting thing that uh, struck me is if you look at the kind of mechanism that was in place by Paris, it's a mechanism does, that does rely on reputational politics, on emulation. Um, it almost goes back to what we used to discuss about 25 years ago, which is a pledge, I suppose it is, a pledge and review system, uh, which relies upon um, reputation making and, and, and making the kind of pledges that will make you um, make you look good in relation to the rest of the international system and it may be perhaps even to your own domestic constituency. So there is that aspect to this COP and uh, I'm not going to say anything at all. One thing I am certain about is that it's uh, of great importance for the British government at this precise moment. Um, 
It's also very difficult, and it has proved very difficult, I think, to avoid politicising um, some of the issues, uh, to, to avoid um, the political issues intruding into the kind of discussions that have gone on at the G7 summit, for example. I mean, running alongside discussions related to climate and climate finance was a clear uh, agenda relating to uh, an anti-China alliance, a G, the G10, the so-called G10. And you can make similar points about the way um, the EU has been dealing with, for instance, Chinese human rights abuses. So in those specific examples, you can see wider politics intruding into climate discussions. And finally, I mean, the final point that I would make, I think, is the very way that Paris, that the Paris Agreement ha has been set up, makes it almost inevitable that climate issues will become heavily politicised because the required actions reach well inside the, indiv the individual parties. Now, if you compare this with other sorts of international negotiation, it's very different. Uh, the, they don't have this important penetration into domestic politics. You can make specific trade agreements and agreements and all manner of other things. But um, these things are pretty fundamental. Energy politics, uh, very difficult for governments to, to handle domestically. I think there's a President Macron found in France with the Gilets Jaunes. And I suppose at the grander scale, I've been impressed um, very recently in the last couple of hours by um, seeing an EU report that notes that the climate action that is occurring now will inevitably lead in itself to major structural changes in international politics and the whole international system, largely because the uh, control of fossil fuels, the ownership of fossil fuels uh, resources has been so central to global politics over the last century. And this is going to cease to be the case. Uh, so this is, ceased to be one of the central determinants of power and conflict relations. So in that sense, what is happening now is going to be significant in the future, not just, as I say, if we can achieve the climate goals that we wish to achieve, but also because the effects of what we do are in themselves going to change the nature of international politics. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, that was really interesting paper, really interesting presentation uh, on the implications of global politics and inequalities um, on climate change decision making in general and in light of the, of the COP26. Uh,